Hurrah! Eric Williams, Sahara Television here. In this segment, we're going to take a look at a new author on the scene. He's been called one of Africa's new stars and a man worth watching. He is known in Africa, but largely unknown outside of the continent. His name is Chude Jidiwan Wo, and he's the author of a book called Are We the Turning Point Generation? Which is a good question. It's a book that talks to and about Nigerians. He takes a hard, humorous, and witty look at a nation now very much in the world headlines. His book also poses some interesting questions to his fellow countrymen, but it is a universal series of questions, as many of the same questions he raises could be posed to Americans on how they look at themselves. I want to say thank you for joining us, Mr. Ginny and Woe, for this segment of Sahara Television, and good day to you. Okay, thank you for having me. It's good to have you here. I guess we got to start off because your your book poses a compelling question, which is simply, are we the turning point uh, generation? And mm. a lot of people, you know, uh, will ask that question not only of themselves, but where they happen to live. So how is that applicable to your nation, your country? And, mm. uh, you know, and how long did it take for you? What made what compelled you to write the book in the first place? Right. Um, well, um, from about 2010, I found myself more keenly involved in, in, um, in um, advocacy, you know, issues of good governance, and trying to get young people to be part of the process of electing new leaders, um, leading up to the 2011 elections. Um, and then in 2012, we had the famous uh, Occupy Nigeria rallies, you know, trying to to, to, to force the government to take uh, accountability in the oil sector more seriously and in the short term to, 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 to restore the subsidy on, on petroleum products. Um, but after that entire period, the, the, the exhilaration of the elections, the uncertainty of the protests, I took some time to read, to reread um, Achebe's The Trouble with Nigeria. And after that, to read Achebe's new book, There Was a Country. And I was struck by the fact that, as anybody who observes Nigeria's problems know, the same issues, it, it was as if I was writing the same book over a period of 20 years. And it struck me that my generation isn't the first that has been trying to answer these questions or to change this country. And I began to ask myself, did we have the capacity as young people, as a generation, as people working on these same issues that he was talking about, would we be able to finally turn the point? Would we be able to break off from the vicious cycle of people coming in with good intentions and nothing changes? And so this book was a result of me trying to answer the questions that I believe Achebe asked, uh, and I believe that young people of my generation need to ask if we are not going to become a cliche like others before us. Okay, that's fair enough. Now, the thing about it is that when one takes on a book project, it mm -hmm. is a major undertaking. And so the first part of my question was, how long did it take for you to get this book, you know, to organize it and to assemble it? And more to the point, how long did it take for you to write it? Was it a, was it a difficult project or did it come about pretty quickly? Well, it was an intensely difficult project. First, I didn't know that it was going to be a book. Um, after reading There Was a Country in, I think, October of 2012, I decided to start a series called um, New Leadership for a New Generation of Leaders. And it was on some of the nation's leading online platforms, Premium Times, Why Nigerian, Better Nigeria, and so on. And so it was a series between, I started it in January, it was to run till March, it ran till April. And so it was just supposed to be an essay series. Um, but in the middle of it, I kind of got tired because it was a pretty intense, it was a pretty intense uh, series of essays to write. It required me disconnecting myself from a lot of the things that I was doing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It required me asking myself some tough questions and doing some tough reading. So halfway into the series, I wanted to give up. I thought, well, like we say in Nigeria, nobody sent me on this errand. So, um, you know, I felt it was too difficult to continue. However, at the same time, a few of my friends, uh, um, um, Benga, Adobe, and so on, said to me that this was an important book to write, this was an important series to write, and that ultimately it would, it would do me well to make it into a book. And so that became the inspiration to complete the series. Um, and so it took me from December 2012 
She writes about April 2013, which was a period of five months to do the book. Um, but then, yes, it was difficult because it wasn't just me mouthing off um, about my opinions. I had to do some really serious reading, trying to counter my own assumptions, trying to challenge my own perspectives, uh, trying to say something, uh, talk about the same things in a different way. Uh, but, I, but at the end of the process, I felt better, you know, about myself. I felt better about my thinking. I felt more confident in my perspective. So it was difficult, but it was ultimately rewarding. Okay. Now, the thing about it is that your book has a compelling headline. Are we the generation, that is, are we the turning point generation, right? Mm -hmm. And then, like, mm -hmm. uh, in the... And what I've read, okay, uh, there's a uh, section on here, because I really take it that a lot of your, uh, what, what you've talked about, you know, is really not only analytical in terms of, a, of an academic approach, but you wanted to really get right to the heart of the matter. Okay, now, now, now the thing about it is that, okay, I'm going to uh, just read an excerpt out of the, out of the uh, one of the uh, chapters. You said that we must kill God. Now, of course, that's rather... Uh, shocking as a mm -hmm. as a title of a of a chapter but there was like one bit in here that uh, that i like to just quote because it really in reading it today it went when i read it it made me laugh out loud so here it goes and this is where you talk about the nigerian god not god is the what we go to worship in a in a house of worship or in a church but a nigerian god so here it comes okay and i'd like for you to talk about this okay just a couple of sec just a couple of sentences these are your words you say that uh, quote uh, uh attribute everything to the nigerian god so if you diverted funds from public projects and are able to afford that phantom when people say you have a nice car say nah god if someone asks what the secret of all your wealth is say god has been good to me by this you mean the Nigerian God who gave you the uncommon wisdom, wisdom to reappropriate public funds. I mean, that's absolutely pretty hilarious stuff and pretty compelling stuff. So in other words, a lot of elected officials and other people in civil society use the, it is the will of God, to commit skullduggery. And the mm -hmm. double side of it is, is that as a result of that mantra, so many people look at people who are devoutly religious in a in, in in a sort of a disingenuous way, yeah. talk about that a little bit because that is a really important point. Right. Thanks. First, uh, first, I can't take credit for that for that phrase because oh. I was paraphrasing a friend of mine, Anath and John, whose thoughts pay aligned with mine. So I took a bit of his article and I credited him in the essay. But however, his views completely align with mine. Now, I'm a Christian. I'm a born again Christian. And like I said, in that, and that's one of my favorite articles, because when you say to people, especially people who are intellectual or who are, who are activists or who are chain makers, that I'm a Christian, I'm a born-again Christian, it immediately assumes that you're full of bullshit. <laughs> so they immediately assume that you're going to come, to come at them with the cliches and you know, all these woolly you know, generalizations. You know, and that's not how I live my own Christianity. Um, um, and so I thought it was very important for myself as a Christian, as an active Christian, who believes in all of those things, who believes in the Holy Spirit, who believes in God, but who also understands the danger of surrendering our critical thinking, um, our sense of right and wrong in the world, our sense of what is appropriate to, to an ambiguous idea of the supernatural. I thought it was important for me to attack that hypocrisy. Um, one of the things that has shocked me as a Nigerian was when the former governor of Bayelsa State, uh, DPA Alam Yesiga, um, um, was caught in the UK for, for money laundering. And, you know, he was kept under house arrest and then he escaped from the house arrest and landed in Nigeria and there was a big reception for him. And when people asked him, how did you find your way back into Nigeria? He said it was to the glory of God. Now, that offended me deeply as a Christian, because the God that I serve and the God that I know and the God I grew up knowing would absolutely rebuke uh, a convicted felon for attributing his escape to a supernatural being. It's so antithetical to what I know as a Christian. Unfortunately, that is what Christianity in most parts of our country has become. People who think once you have 
once you fear God, once you respect God, once you, you say a few words of Christianese, it's a carte blanche protection against the consequences of stealing, of, of robbery, of misappropriation, of corruption, of rape, of child abuse. It is not so. And so that book really was to say there is a different God in Egypt that some Nigerians seem to worship. But that God isn't founded in the Bible. That God isn't the God that I know. And that God is the excuse that people have used to keep Nigeria far back, far behind where it should be at this point in time. So that was for me as a Christian, my own tribute to other Christians to say, this is not God. This is not the God of the Bible. I, 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 can, I can appreciate that. I didn't know, for example, that uh, Nigeria was one of the biggest exporters of uh, religion and, you know, certainly people who uh, make uh, pilgrimage, pilgrimages to places like uh, Israel and to Mecca. Now, of course, your book doesn't just merely uh, center on aspects of religion. There was a couple of things that really jumped out at me. One of them was that, uh, and I'm going to quote this, this is you, you say, on the one hand, Nigeria is a sinking ship but we must not desert it. Talk about that a little bit, please. Yes. Now, um, um, you know, so, 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 I mean, if you're young, I mean, it can be difficult, you know, to, I think that many of us mm, exist in a reality distortion field, at least those in leadership, in terms of, in terms of denying the scale of our problems, in terms of denying the scale of corruption, in terms of denying the, the, the lack of depth in governance, in terms of denying the lack of faith that many Nigerians now have in the Nigerian project. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of willful, or like Hillary Clinton would call it, a willing suspension of disbelief. Um, I have refused to allow myself to be seduced by that. However, I am a very patriotic Nigerian. I believe completely in my country. Now, in asking myself, how can you acknowledge how bad things are and how difficult it can be to regenerate and rebuild the country? How can you square that off with the inevitable hope that you need to rebuild the country? How can you, in one breath, know that this is very, this is almost a hopeless situation that hasn't gotten better in a long time, with the imperative to be hopeful and to keep working to rebuild the only country that you have? And in trying to wrestle with those questions, I realized that, that hope as a philosophy for any patriot, for anybody who believes in country, doesn't have to be rooted in, 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 if hope, for, hope has to exist with or without circumstances that should generate hope. Uh, so I look at countries like Liberia, who, have fought, who, who, who went through this disastrous war, countries like Rwanda, who went through this, this, this horrific genocide. And I'm asking myself, my country's problems are not as bad as that yet. And these countries, despite how hopeless it appeared a few years ago, a decade ago, two decades ago, managed to rebuild themselves. You know, I'm reading an article in Foreign Affairs, you know, this, this, this month of President Kagame talking about Rwanda's rebirth. And it strikes me that, look, these people managed to find strength at the time of complete hopelessness. But how they were able to do this was to acknowledge the scale of the problem. There is no... Uh, danger in saying, look, this is, pretty, this is a pretty hopeless case, but we will still have hope because it is still possible to build a nation no matter how bad it is. I now, understand. for me, I have to first acknowledge the scale of the problem by saying, this ship is sinking. It is sinking, you know. They, I mean, you look at what's happening with, with the Chibok girls, and you look at what's happening with the scale of corruption in the oil sector. It looks like a sinking ship. All However... Right. We must not desert it because we have no option, because it's our only country. The moment we lose faith completely is the moment that everything goes to the door. So it, it's in trying to appreciate, wrestle with the complexity and the difficulty of the problem and not deny it, but still find a pathway from which we can survive this problem. Okay, that let me, that okay let me ask you this then, because I'm really, I'm really curious about that. And uh, what, when you talk about, when you are talking to, uh, and talking about the conditions in your country, and you're talking about the way that many of your countrymen react to what's occurring in your country, you say that Nigeria is not a great country, it wasn't a great country yesterday, it isn't a great country today, that it can be great, it should be great, 
and it could have been great. And if we sit down and get serious, it will be great. And you say, mm -hmm. but here is the good news. It's not too late. So mm -hmm. with, with that point of view, what has been the reaction to your book among your peers, fellow writers, and in the public that has read it thus far? What kind mm -hmm. of feedback are you getting? I, I mean, I, I, what I sense from people, from those who have read it, and I'm grateful for that reaction, is a sense of, uh, of, of um, a sense of uh, identification, identity. Like people identify with what I'm saying, because especially those Nigerians in Nigeria, because they live with it every day. And I think people are glad that I didn't kind of bury my head in the sand in trying to be hopeful. Because I believe in being hopeful. I believe in retaining hope in people, faith in country, and even minimal support for leadership, no matter how abysmal it is, because we have no choice. All right, However, let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. You're right, no, I, I'm, I'm following what you're saying, because one of the things that you hear in much of the English-speaking world, right, is that today's generation, that is people born in, the say, the 1980s and the 1990s, that apathy, not just to Nigerians, but apathy among the young people in much of the English-speaking world, it seems to be right now the order of the day. Is that the same kind of issue or aspect of your society that you see? And, and if so, is that what compelled you to write the book? Well, um, so yes, there's apathy, and understandably so. I mean, much of the world, I mean, if, if you look at the continent, for instance, young people in Kenya, young people in South Africa who just went to the poll, young people in Nigeria, there's a sense of satisfaction with the leaderships of these countries and the kinds of country they presented to young people. So it is understandable why there is apathy. There's apathy in, mo in much of the continent where young people feel like their leaders are not, are not acting up to, are, are not living up to power. I don't want to talk about Europe and other, other parts of the world. I want to talk about Africa because that's my area of keen interest. But yes, there is apathy. Now, part of writing this book was yes. And if you look at, there's a last chapter where I wrote about uh, 52 things we need to do. It's also a clarion call to my generation. It's also um, a sense of, I understand the apathy. I understand the anger. I understand the frustration. I understand this deep cynicism about the capacity for our country to be rebuilt. However, again, like I said, we have no choice. It is our responsibility as Nigerians living in Nigeria, working for Nigeria, to keep doing the work that we need to do to rebuild the country, to keep demanding better governance, step onto the streets when it's necessary to, to, to build sustainable organizations that can influence change and all of that. So yes, it is some sort of a clarion call. It is a, I am part of this. I have been part of many change movements. I have tried to do my best as an active citizen. And I understand why we are angry and why we feel that we shouldn't get involved. However, if we do not get involved, what happens to the country? So it is me trying to attack the apathy. It is me trying to respond to the sense of hopelessness. It is me trying to find strength from, this, from the atmosphere of helplessness that we have. It's also an expression of faith. I do honestly believe that if enough of us get angry and active over a sustained period of time, Nigeria can get better. Okay, so on that one, you certainly do uh, leave, you certainly uh, give people a, a, a taste of, of being hopeful rather than hopelessness. I, I, I guess uh, on that, on that uh, track, and then I have to ask you that obviously this is not going to be the last book you ever write about your society. Mm -hmm. What's next? Well, what's next is to is is the, what's I mean I'm focused on this book. I I I, I assume uh, that course. if I continue, I assume that if I continue to to be active, and I do intend to be active in the things in the issues that concern my country um, over a period of time, and I continue to think through these issues. At certain points in my evolution as a person, as a professional, I will write these books more often. Yes, I do believe that. I do not know. I do not have any immediate plans, but I do anticipate that more questions will arise. I will be involved in more activities from my little corner, and I will want to share those perspectives to try and galvanize my generation to get more involved. Um, and so I envisage that. More than that, more actively, I envisage myself being involved in the day-to-day -day issues that affect my country. You know, I, I feel like, like I went to my forward, 
that one of the most important duties I owe myself and I owe my country and I owe my continent is to continue to have a clear voice that says what I feel at any point in time and that uses the influence, whatever small influence that I have, whatever small capacity that I have, to try and move the issues concerning my country forward. So that I know from Bring Back the Girls to Citizen Solution to End Terrorism to, to you know, accountability in the oil sector to trying to get young people access to jobs and opportunities. I know that I will keep working as I am now on these issues and I anticipate that the more I work on these issues, the more I will have perspectives that I want to share through articles or through a book like this in the near future. All right. Well, we certainly look uh, forward to that. that. That's for sure. And uh, I certainly, uh, you know, I mean, again, you may be talking to the people of your homeland, but mm -hmm. there is a universal message. Absolutely. It's the sense that I get in, in, reading, in reading what I've read of your book, and I've actually knocked out a couple of chapters on that. And I, I just want to thank you for that, uh, you know, because... When somebody says that here is one of Africa's new rising stars and a man worth watching, does that put additional pressure on you to produce, you know? I mean, I got to... Actually, I mean, it doesn't just put pressure on me to produce. It just puts pressure on me as a human being. As a, I, mean, if, I mean, this is Bishop, Bishop Matthew Kuka. He has been a role model of mine for 20 years since I was in high school. So, you know, and, and, and I, I, to hear him say that, makes me realize that I belong to a generation that people have a lot of hope in, that people have a lot of faith in. And as a person, I have to keep holding myself to the highest standards. And, and even when I fall, tumble from those standards, I have to pick myself up immediately and keep working. So beyond even the ability to produce, just the ability to keep doing the work that I'm doing and to keep doing it to the highest ethical standards possible, quotes like Bishop Cook has put me under that incredible pressure. But I don't mind it. Pressure is good. I mean, uh, we have a lot of work to do as, as a generation. We have a lot of work to do as a country. And we need as many of us who, understands the, who understand the imperative of that action. So if uh, that Bishop Cook and other people who talked about the book put me under that pressure, I can only be grateful for it, and I can only keep working. All right, so I take the position then, as we would say here, you're just getting started, right? I mean, that's, not, that's, that's, that's really what it sounds like to me. <laughs> All right, listen, I'll tell you what, Jude, we're going to leave this conversation right here, but I certainly want to have you come back on here again to talk okay. about future projects, which it sounds like to me you're going to be engaging in quite a few. All right? Yeah. All right, thank so you. Thank, no, you. No, no, thank, thank you for joining us. Okay, thank we've you. just Welcome. been speaking with, um, with Jude Jidwanwo, and uh, his book is called Are We the Turning Point Generation? It is a universal message that anybody who cares about their state of affairs in their respective countries, not just in Nigeria and not just in Africa, but anywhere, could certainly take to the bank. And certainly it is a thought-provoking uh, look at the world about us and certainly the world inside of Nigeria, which is really quite fascinating. Thank you for joining us. And uh, you're watching Sahara Television. I'm Eric Williams in New York.